Praise the Lord. If you'll turn in your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to continue our look at the cross exchange, and most importantly, what took place on the cross for us in our faith, in our, in our walk with the Lord, what, where it originates from. And so I read this morning, I read this morning from verse, uh, chapter 53, verses 1 and following. And actually, we can go back to 52. I want to start in 52, verse 13. Because God's speaking, he says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance and his, his form beyond that of the child, children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they, say, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what we, he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah, hundreds of years, 800 years before the cross, gives us the depiction of what Jesus would do by dying on Calvary's cross. That is what the picture was given to us by the Holy Spirit through the prophet Isaiah. And, you know, many have questioned me, well, Pastor, you always say to us that, that he was beaten in his face, in his body, and his face was bruised so bad that he was uh, not even recognized. Where is that found? And I just read it to you, where it says in verse uh, chapter 52, where it says that, um, uh, verse 14, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance. He's already talking about, he's talking about what happened when he was beaten before the cross. Think about that. Think about just the, the just, just that. Have you ever seen anybody who, who had black, or had, who had two black eyes from a fight and their eyes were shut or you didn't recognize them at first because they were in, maybe in a car accident, their face was, you know, hit the uh, uh, um, uh, safety uh, shield that comes out of the steering wheel, the, the, the airbag. Uh, you know, you can't recognize them at first. Or somebody who's had major surgery, and they're all black and blue, and they're all puffed up, and if you walked in and didn't know it was their room and didn't know who it was, you wouldn't have been able to recognize them. This is how Jesus looked upon the cross. And last week, I began to tell, share with us and introduce to us this Isaiah 53 moment. And according to Isaiah, just as a, a matter of review, the death of Christ on the cross was painful. We must never forget that it was painful. That according to Isaiah and to the prophetic that Jesus dying on the cross would be a horrific death. It would not be an ordinary death. It would not be just a death by execution where some people would, would shoot at him or he would be hung. But he hung on a cross 
after a, a night of being beaten and abused and spat at and his beard pulled out and crown of thorns put on his head and 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 and, and tightly fitted on his head so he'd bleed from every from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet and then spikes that would resemble what we call railroad spikes with sharp edges at the end would be driven into his arms and to his or to his hands his wrists and to his feet to keep him on the cross. We get a paper cut and we moan and groan. We hit ourselves with a hammer on our thumb and we go, oh! And yet, the Lord Jesus Christ endured such a horrific death, according to Isaiah. According to Isaiah, the death of Christ on the cross was God's idea. That God crucified him. That God allowed his son to be crucified. Do you realize before man was made, the Bible says before the foundations of the world, before, before Genesis 1, where it says God said, let there be light, and the big bang happened, the real big bang, God's thundering voice exploded, and the light came, and all the, 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 the universe came into being. Before that happened, before Genesis 1, there was a the idea that God had already planned Jesus' crucifixion for mankind. Talk about not leaving anything undone. He planned with the Son, this is how you're going to die one day in the earth we're getting ready to make. And this is the picture we have of it. It was God's idea. It was His idea to crucify his son. According to Isaiah, the death of Christ would be the full punishment, the 100% paid in full punishment for yours and my sins, for yours and my iniquities, and for yours and my trespasses. And I will speak next week about what is the difference between sins, iniquities, and trespasses. Big difference, but he died for them all. He didn't leave anything unpunished. And according to Isaiah, Christ's cross was a crushing blow to Jesus. It crushed him. It crushed him. According to Isaiah, as I said last week, Christ's cross was an offering for our sin. And I asked the question, which was really important last week, is this the cross that we preach? Is the cross that Isaiah depicts for us? Is the cross that, that, that we celebrate on Good Friday, which we should, be, we should be celebrating and carrying every day, but we make a, and we should, we make a really big deal about it during the Lent season and during the Holy Week, and on Good Friday we make a big crescendo of the cross, and we should. I'm not saying we shouldn't. We absolutely should. But what I want to say to you this morning is it is important for us to understand that the cross is not just a once a year celebration. The cross isn't just a once a year observation. And the cross is to be a lifestyle for everyone who follows after Jesus. And that right there should cause the church to say, Amen! Amen! <laughs> Because that is the message that we are to preach. Jesus crucified, buried, and raised. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes that clear that the very gospel, and here's the thing, the very gospel that Paul was willing to die for, the very gospel that Peter was willing to die for, the very gospel that, that John was willing to die for, and the other disciples and apostles and followers of Christ were willing to die for was not the message of, we hope you get better and feel better, but the message of Jesus dying on the cross for humanity. That was what they were willing to give their lives for. How dare we who have come behind them such a great sacrifice that they made to get this message out. They weren't afraid of their reputations. They weren't afraid of going to prison. They weren't even afraid of death. They gave it all for one message. One message. Not that you would have the best life now, but that you would know that Jesus Christ died on the cross and you were called to live the same. And I asked another question. Is this the cross 
that we still have in our focus? Is this the focus, of, a focal point of our faith? And is this the cross that we still cling to? Or are we clinging to what I submitted to you last week might be a whole new cross that gets preached in today's churches? The watered-down version of Calvary. I don't know how you can do it, but you can. It's almost like, don't show the movie The Passion. Show it backwards and he doesn't die. <laughs> it's like the Titanic. It's much better watching it backwards than it doesn't sink. It goes, whoa, 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 resurrection. Right? I could only watch that movie one time, The Titanic, only because there was too much water in it. And it just keeps everything. Let's go to this hallway. No, more water. Let's go to this hallway. More water. More water. It was like two hours of just water, water, water everywhere. <laughs> Couldn't take it. I was like, every, every hallway they went into, this one's, ah, this one's, ah, ah, ah. It's like, all right, whatever. You know you're going to drown. You know you're in a sinking ship. <clears throat> What is this whole new cross that I introduced to us last week? As a matter of just looking back, the new cross allows for us to coexist with our sin. Where do you get that at? But that's what they're saying. Because the new grace is you get to tolerate sin. The new grace that the church is preaching so that we can fill up quicker and so that we don't make anybody upset with us tolerate sin and we accept everybody we do but we accept them and we accept their sin and we do but we don't deal with it we never talk about it we never bring the cross into it because we don't want to offend them and let me tell you something paul made it clear peter made it clear jesus made it clear this message will tick some really important people off it will offend people if you preach the cross you preach the cross of Jesus. You know why? Because every apostle, every disciple, everyone in the early church that was in the book of Acts and following, they gave their lives to the point where they believed that the cross and their sins were, were, came to a head and they had to die to their flesh daily. There was no tolerating. Matter of fact, chapter 5 of Acts shows us that not even a very little lie is tolerated. When you remember Ananias and Sapphira, they lied and they died. Woo, that rhymes. They lied and they died. And guess what? Why? Because Isn't it interesting? They lied and they didn't go, oh, it's okay. It's all under grace. It's all under grace. It's just a little white lie. Where do we get categories of lying from? We got the white ones, the gray ones, and the dark ones. The dark ones are the ones that Jesus died for. The gray ones, eh, go either way. And the white ones, he just kind of lets you coexist with. Huh. It's almost like this. How many lies do you have to tell to become a liar? Is it like 10 and a neon sign goes off and says liar, liar, pants on fire? Or is it just one? You know, we, we act as though that, 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 that there's an accumulation and then now I am a liar. Now I have done this. No, all it takes is one act. One act. This new cross makes it easy for us to follow Jesus. We, we, it's just, come in, Jesus will make everything better in your life. I'm going to tell you something. Following Jesus has made things a lot more painful. <laughs> you say, why would anybody want to come? Because it's eternal life. It's the only way to eternal life. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. This new cross is not meant to be too painful. We don't want to make people feel uneasy, Pastor. Do you think Jesus felt a little uneasy on the cross? The new cross is about lifting up our self-esteem, as I said last week. It's a cross that doesn't speak of a daily visit, and it doesn't require us to have any death to the flesh. The other thing it doesn't do is the cross doesn't transform us. There's no change in us. We don't have to change. We get to stay the way we are. Yeah. But the cross that Jesus died on is a radical cross. It's a radical lifestyle. And last week, uh, as a way of uh, 
of reminding us, I, I introduced and submitted to you that there were at least seven beautiful exchanges on the cross of Calvary. The first one came from 2 Corinthians 5.21. According to 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible says that Jesus became sin for us. He became my sin. He became your sin. He exchanged our sin for his righteousness. Every awful, as I said last week, every awful and horrendous sin and act that I ever committed, he exchanged it so that I could be righteous, so that you could be righteous the second exchange, according to Galatians 3, 13 through 14, was that he took our place, is that he redeemed us from the curse. That curse is found in Genesis 3, after the fall of man, and at, that, at the cross of Christ, the curse of the law was removed from our lives. The law demanded that we die. The law demanded that you die. At, at the cross of Jesus, Jesus became the curse for us. So now we move on to the next two exchanges. The last one I believe the Lord has prepared us for already that we're going to do, uh, that we're going to share at the end of the service. And the third exchange comes from our main text, Isaiah 53 3. Let me read it to you. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. And we esteemed him not. The third exchange at Jesus' cross is that Jesus took our rejection in order for us to be accepted. He took on our rejection so that you could be accepted. As the Son of God, and think about this, Jesus had known complete acceptance from the Father. He had never known up until the cross what it was like to not be accepted by his Father. He was 100% totally accepted by the Father. And then Jesus on the cross, because he took on our sins, he became despised and rejected on our behalf. Jesus became abandoned and betrayed by his closest friends, didn't he? Remember the night in which he was betrayed? Remember he was not only betrayed by Judas, but as he's in, the, in Gethsemane, first of all, he's trying to pray. And he wants them to pray with them. They can't even stay awake. And then when he gets arrested, they follow him from afar, but they all scatter. And the Bible said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And that's exactly what happened. And all of them forsook him. None of them came to his defense. I'm not talking about getting their spears out and their swords out and doing a physical defense. But none of them came to the trial and said, I'll, I'll testify for him. Did you notice that? We, we don't look at it that way, do we? There was a mockery of a trial, and that trial included all these false accusations, and none of his disciples and nobody that he healed went and said, I'll testify on his behalf. They all forsook him. That was bad enough, wasn't it? But then there was those awful words that come from the cross. My God! My God, why have you forsaken me? Do you know the agony in which Jesus was speaking those words and why? It's because he became sin for us. The Father could not look at sin, and the Father himself withdrew himself from his own Son. He rejected his own Son on your behalf. He was making this exclamation of agony for the first time he had felt rejection from the Father. The first time in his entire existence he felt separated from the Father. For you. For me. And then we go around gleefully saying, oh, the cross isn't that bad. I don't have to bear a cross. I'm on resurrection side, pastor. I speak resurrection. As a pastor, I speak resurrection. So don't I. But you cannot ever have a resurrection without a death. He suffered your rejection so that you would be accepted in the beloved family of the Father. The only way, because we were rejected our sins, our iniquities, our trespasses caused God to, to reject us. So not only was the first exchange he became our sin, and then the second exchange was, was that, 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 he, that he became what for us? 
The first one was sin. Second, did you write it down? What was the second exchange from last week? He redeemed us. And third, we're here in the third one, and what happened? He became rejected for us. How many of you like being rejected? It feel good? You know what I'm talking about. I'll just put you in my life. You know, fifth grade. You were there. All we were doing was playing kickball. And all Tony and Marty had to do was pick teams. And there was a bunch of us there because it was gym class. I'll take this one. And I'll take that one. I'll take the scrawny one over there and that one over there. And then last, we'll take Dorman. You know what it's like being picked last, feeling rejected. Or how about that, guys, you remember that, that girl? You remember that girl in 10th grade? You're going to go ask her to the dance? And you're just sure, because you, now you're in 10th grade, you no longer send the notes, do you like me, yes or no, check one and send it to your friend, and she sends it to her friend, and then it comes back like three different friends later, you open it up and it says she likes you, and then you don't know what to do at 5th grade, you go, oh my God, she likes me, what do I do? You throw out a piece of paper away. But in 10th grade, it's different. You go up to her, uh, uh, you remember, all sheepishly, you remember, it's when, when a lot of you guys had hair and all that, and, you're looking handsome, and you, you, you smell good. And this is before Axe ever came out. I'm not talking the book of Axe. The AXE you could spray on you. We, we used uh, Old Spice and, and English leather because that's what was brute. That was another one. And we walked up, and we matted our hair down really good and brushed our teeth, and we went up there all. <laughs> and, uh, and our voice was changing. Hi, Sally. Oh. Would you would you like to go to the dance with me? And she's like, Ew, no. And you walk away, go, I didn't think so. <laughs> and you walk over to your friends and go, boy, that felt good. No. It's called rejection. It hurts. Right? Times that by a billion, and that's how Jesus felt. If you've ever been rejected. He suffered rejection so that you could become accepted as a son or a daughter in the family of God. He suffered complete rejection from the Father so that you could be accepted into the family of God. The fourth exchange comes from our text as well. And this is the one that, that we need to concentrate on a little bit more this morning. I'm going to take my time with a little bit more. And that is in verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And by his stripes, by his stripes, we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. Jesus in this fourth exchange exchanged our sickness and our diseases for healing and health. He exchanged our, our sickness and our diseases for healing and health. You see, this verse, if you read it in the Hebrew, it's very ripe with the language of exchanging and substituting. It's very legal. This, this, this chapter is a very legal verse, if you will, a very legal chapter. It's written, written with legal terms throughout it in the Hebrew, which the Hebrew reader, or those of us who read it now in the English, if we understood the uh, language of the law, it's basically sharing with us that, that if you were in a court of law, that, that this one who is, would be Jesus, when he comes, he would, he would be a substitute for us. He would exchange what we deserve for punishment and for judgment, and he would take it and he would flip it, and that we would come away and we would be exonerated. 
And in this case, it's Jesus' wounds that were wound. He was wounded. His wounds were for one reason. They were for our transgressions. And then he was bruised for our iniquities. Then it says our peace, any peace that Jesus said he left us, which was his peace, he says was purchased because he was chastised. Do you know what chastised means? He was disciplined for our sins. But then it goes on to say that the stripes on Jesus brought us healing. What were those stripes? Well, those are the stripes that you don't want to look at uh, when you're watching the Passion. It's those 39 lashes. You see, there was, a wh there was a whipping that took place on Jesus' body. It's called scourging. And scourging was, with, with, was a Roman uh, form of torture. And it, and it had a, a handle, and then it had a, a whip, and many times it was called the cat of nine tails. It would have about nine different leather uh, separations. And at the end of each of those lengths of cords was broken pieces of pottery and glass and rocks and all types of very painful, sharp objects that they would tie. And so what they would do to somebody who got scourged, and in this case with Jesus, they gave him 39. And why? Because 40 was considered the death blow. And so they, they, they said 40 minus 1, which means you can't kill him by scourging. He has to die on the cross. And so what happens is they, they then would tie his wrist and they would pull him through this, uh, um, you know, this uh, wench. And there was a big hole and it, with the rope would go through and they would bring him up and they would bring him up to a point where just his tippy toes would be touching the ground so that his skin was nice and taut, nice and tight. And Jesus was probably built like me, a real man, just real tight. <laughs> That's, that was painful. <laughs> but Jesus was very fit. The, 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 the type of work he had done in life would have, would have caused him to be a pretty fit in a human being. And so they bring him up, and, he's, and if you've ever gone to a point where you would just reach up and things get tight, imagine you're, you're, you're getting so tight that every part of you from head to toe is stretched now. And while he's hanging there, the first one comes through. And it wraps around his body. And then they pull it so that everything at the edges rips into him. That's one. And then, and then they... That's two. And they're laughing. That's three. Do I mean to do 39 of them? Because it takes a while to do 39, because after you pull and tear, you have to, it has to unravel, come back, and then you have to do it again. So it's not like, it's like, <clears throat> historians, credible doctors around the world say that by the time he was ripped open that many times, his organs, internal organs, would have began to show chunks of his skin chunks of his skin ripped off his body 39 times 39 times he endured that whip the Bible says that those stripes 39 of them were for our healing for our healing. It was the precursor to the cross. And many times when I'm praying for somebody's healing, I will feel led by the Holy Spirit to say, Lord Jesus, I ask you to apply the stripe that will heal this person's life upon them so that they would be healed in Jesus' name. Whatever stripe that represents, would you put it on and heal them? By your stripes we are healed. That means sickness. That means pain. That means infirmities, are, which were all a result of Genesis 3, were now taken care of. Why do you think that not only 
the, he could do it, but why don't you think that the apostles in the early church would lay hands on people and people would recover because they were claiming the work that Jesus did for them on the cross, their message, and they also proclaimed to, to the people that they prayed what Jesus did by the stripes upon his back. Peter recalls it for us in one of his letters, by his stripes we are healed. Healing was not limited to Jesus' day, and it was not limited to super-Christians. It's not limited to people of hyper-faith or super-faith. It's for any who believe in what Jesus has done for them. Divine healing is still a part and should still be taught in the local church. We here believe in divine healing. I believe that you can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. I believe that you can lay hands on tumors and they will go away. I believe you can lay hands on people in wheelchairs and they can get up and walk. I've seen it. We've seen it. Many of us have seen it. We've lived it. We watched it. It wasn't hyperbole. It wasn't a show. It was real. It was real, real stuff, man. People who had real infirmities, who had real sicknesses, up, got raised up in Jesus' name and walked again, heard again, could see again, could talk for the first time. All the things. I've seen it. We've seen it. Many of us have seen those things, but why don't we see it occurring as, as, it, as it used to? It's because I believe we're, we're afraid or we're, we're concerned of what it might sound like to tell somebody, I believe in divine healing. I'm not concerned. I believe in divine healing. I believe that Jesus heals. I believe his stripes bring healing. I, hey, listen, I'm in sales, not management. I don't know why everybody doesn't get healed. I just believe in it, though. I can't speak as to why you prayed for somebody who ended up passing away. I don't know the answer to why they weren't healed on this side of eternity. I don't know. But I still believe. I still believe in the healing power of, of, of my God. I still believe that by his stripes I am healed. Not that I might be healed, but that I am healed. I'm still going to, you know what, I'll go down to the grave saying that. If, if I had cancer tomorrow, I, I would stay, and, I, and they told me I'm going to die of it. In, in, a, in a year from now, I'm going to say every day, by his stripes I am healed until something changes. I'm going to believe it. I'm going to believe it. You say, if some people would be watching, or some people might even think in Christianity or think of us as Christians, you're foolish. Well, Paul said, I'll be a fool for Christ because this is the message I believe. I'd rather look foolish to man than stand before God going, well, and look foolish before him. I believe this. Not that I might be healed. I am healed, and I will, I will speak it out. And when... We come to Christ and His cross. We can exchange all of our sickness, all of our infirmities, all of our addictions and diseases for His healing. And when we come to the cross of Jesus Christ, we exchange our pain for His healing. We exchange our PTSD for healing. We exchange our mental uh, obsessions for, for healing. I've watched people come to their right mind when people prayed over them for healing. I've seen people in bones straighten out. You've heard mine on my head where the bones stuck out and I was falling asleep in school and my mom took me, my mom and dad had to take me to seven different specialists to figure out what was going on with me neuro neurologically. They're probably like, you know, the uh, scarecrow trying to find my brain. But it was I would sit there and I'd be talking and or the teacher would be talking and I'd put my head down like this and an hour later the teacher would be going, Eric, are you okay? I had no clue. I, 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 my, matter of fact, I had my license and I couldn't drive because just in case something like that happened, did I have something else going on? And, and, and I was in excruciating pain. My head was just throbbing at times. It would just throb. I could, you ever have a headache that you can hear it? I, 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 I remember it. And then on Sunday morning, Arnold Hashman, my pastor, my mom says, listen, we've been to seven specialists. I think it's time we go up and have you pray for us. You should probably have done that at the beginning. That would have been the easier. But we went to seven specialists uh, because the doctor told us to. I went to eye doctors. I went to all these different specialists. And Arnold Hashman came and he laid his right hand on me. 
As he laid his right hand on me, I heard a snap, crackle, and pop. It was like the Rice Krispie cereal all in my head. And the pain went away instantly. And I went like this because it was over here. And I used to have a bone from my surgery that stuck out. Stuck out about that little. And I would nick it every time I combed it. We used combs back in my day. It's like the fawns. And I would nick it every once in a while. It was gone. We went back to the specialist. I had no more pain. My head was completely round now, no bump. And the neurologist said, oh, you know what happened? They forgot, you know, did they ever tell you that when you had your surgery, your head would eventually, like, grow into an adult head and boom? No, they didn't tell me that. Well, that's what ha has been happening. You're coming into your adult body, and so your head is, and basically what was happening, my, 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 my skull was shifting. But I also know it was the Lord because it's, it would, as soon as he laid hands on me and said, in Jesus' name, be healed, be, boom, that cracked, snapple and pop, boom, and I, did, and I was done. Now, I don't have the prettiest head, but I, have, I do have a round head. It's flat. It's flat, right? You know, you know how we got saved, right? I got saved because I was extremely sick. The doctors were convinced I had leukemia. I, I, I had had so many needles poking in me and through me at 10 years old, it, was, it, was, it wasn't even funny. I missed my fourth grade year because I was home for most of it. I, I was so fatigued and so lethargic that, that I, I would sleep about 20 of the 24 hours in a day. My parents had have to carry me places. When I went to the doctor, I remember going to get my hair cut, and my mom and uh, my brother actually, because my mom couldn't, but my brother Dan carried me into the place to get my hair cut. And my mom and my dad, I remember them sitting. I remember it was February. They were sitting at the at the dinner at the kitchen table, and you could see out into the into the fields. And it was a snowy morning, and they were talking about it. I didn't know what was going on, and it was the first time I ever heard about what was going on. And and I said, "Am I going to die?" And they said, "We don't know." How'd you like to hear that from your parents? Hey, are you gonna die? Am I gonna die? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> And so they did all these tests, and, and they were getting ready to do some more tests to confirm whether or not I had this, this leukemia. They, 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 were, they were convinced that, that that was the only thing that, that made sense. And, and uh, of course, the technology back then in 1976 was a little different than it is today. And, and my mom and dad, you know, they began, to, you know, they didn't know. My mom was a praying woman. She gets saved during that time. I end up getting saved. And, and, and lo and behold, shortly after I get saved, I start getting strength in my body. People are praying for me. I didn't know the pastor had been praying for me. That, that, it's Arnold Hashman again. He lays hands on me. Others are laying hands on me. I don't know what's going on, but I'm just saying, okay, whatever. I don't know. They're praying for me. I go back to the doctor, and the doctor says, I don't know what's happened, but everything in his blood count, everything else has gone to where it needs to go. He's okay. Hallelujah. You know? <laughs> yeah, he's he's there, and then and then and, and then you know I mean uh, I mean you could just talk I could talk all day about the healing power of God, but uh, I want you to turn to James chapter five real quick because this morning uh, Pastor and I are going to anoint you with oil because if anybody needs healing this morning, we're we're going to do what the Bible says to do, and it says this. It says this in verse 13 of chapter 5 of James. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. And is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. That's, that, that, that's the New Testament version of, of, of being able to uh, believe in healing. It's how, it, it's how they, the early church did it. They, they believed, they were called. The oil represents the Holy Spirit. And so they would call for the elders of the church. They would lay hands on them. They would anoint them with oil. And, and they would recover. 